Uh, take your Bible, turn to um, Deuteronomy 6. I'm going to give you some words from the Lord this, this morning, and I'm going to go home. Um, I was, uh, I've been crying all day yesterday when Michael sent me the pictures. And um, uh, very, very emotional thing uh, for, for me and for my family. I know for Michael, um, him wanting to go to Kenya to try to save our office space, I don't think was really what was weighing on his heart as much as these four children were. And um, I don't want to, um, I want to be humble in saying this, but I don't want to under, underscore it either. We saved their lives. Okay, we literally saved their lives. There are people that die um, often in Turkana because of starvation. And that can only be compounded when there's no parents in that house. So the Lord allowed this church to save the lives of four children. And um, for that, I want to say, number one, thanks be to God. And number two, there's some things being said about this church, about me, and about the people in this church. And I want to say that I have never been more proud to be a part of this church than I am right now. And um, if you want to say something about this church or the people in this church, go somewhere else and say it. Can I hear God's people say amen? Deuteronomy 6. If you have your Bibles there, this is what it's all about. We were talking in Sunday school about um, law keeping. Ellen White's Seventh day Adventist Gospel. She says that the fourth commandment, which is the commandment to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, that God glorifies that one commandment above the rest of the commandments. James says that if man offends the law in one point, he is guilty of all. And when it comes to the two commandments that Christ gave us, both of which are the same in God's eyes, that if you will love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might, which to those of us who have been forgiven of our sins, that's an easy task. If you really do love God, then loving your neighbors and even loving your enemies is also the same in God's eyes. And they're also just as easy because we don't love with our brain. We love with our heart. And when you're saved, God gives you a brand new heart to love with. Amen? Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. In fact, let's, let's stand. I don't do this often, but if I can stand, you can stand. But I'm not going to stand long. I know that. I don't, know if it's, I don't know if it's the weather. Um, the weather had me down yesterday, and uh, I wasn't feeling all that great this morning when I got here. And it's just been getting a little bit worse as the morning goes on. I've had this happen before, as some of you know. And uh, I just can attribute it to the devil. And uh, he doesn't like me, he doesn't like us. And if he don't like it, too bad. Amen. But um, anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 6, let's read this out loud together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. They shall write them upon the posts of thy house 
and on thy gates. Heavenly Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd bless your words this morning. Bless this church. And Father, I thank you. That of all the things, Father, that we have done wrong in our life. All the things, dear God, that have dishonored you. All the things, God, that have brought shame and reproach both to ourselves and to your holy name. Father, I thank you that out of all the people in the world that you chose to go bring life to four children who could have died, that, Father, you chose Bethel Church. It's an honor. It is with joy that we serve you today. And, Father, it is nothing at all for us to stand for your word and to stand for you and to say this morning, Father, that we love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our might. Father, I pray that you'd bless and honor your word this morning. Father, bless the messenger, bless the message, and bless these that have come, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, you may be seated, by the way. I'm going to let the word of God do the talking this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 7, in fact, there'll be seven places in Deuteronomy, so keep your Bible open there. Deuteronomy chapter 7, know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, He is the faithful God, and I want you to notice what your Bible says, which keepeth covenant and mercy. Now, if you're like me, I've needed a lot of mercy in my life, and God has made a covenant with us. He says in Jeremiah chapter 31, 31, that that covenant is not like the covenant that he made with our fathers or with the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, which covenant they break. But it's a new covenant. God said that he would write his law in our hearts and put them in our lives. And that he would forgive all of our sins and he would have mercy on us forever and ever. And I want you to notice that with those that will love God, God promises that he would keep his covenant with them. He said, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Again, I'm going to let the word of God do the preaching this morning. By the way, did John tell you about hope? You didn't get to that yet, John? Man, I'm sorry to steal your thunder. Um, I preached <clears throat> on hell Monday night. And um, just, let the, just let God do what God does best. And I looked down there and there's hope down there. How old is she? Can you get saved at seven? Well, she got saved Monday night. Yeah, amen. And uh, so we'll be having a baptism here before too long, so you pray for her. Hopefully hers won't be like mine. I, the year I got saved at uh, Bible camp, there were several of them that came to the altar that week that were here from this church. And um, we was all going to get baptized the same Sunday night. Well, they made me go last because I had poison ivy from here down. I couldn't stay out of the woods, so they made me go last. So, But anyway, we'll be having her baptism. But it was just a good week. And while I'm thinking about it, uh, number one, appreciate Phil and Garrett. He's leaving. So he knows I'm going to talk about him. But uh, Phil always goes down, helps with the activities and helps with the sports. So appreciate him. And then, um, let's see, Hope got saved. And then J.R. Uh, was voted uh, Camper of the Week for our, from our church. Camper of the Week. Give him a hand. And then, let's see, Callie and Isaac 
got noted for memorizing the most Bible verses. Yeah, give them a hand. And uh, Caleb for being the best sportsman, right? And let's see here. Me for being the best piano player. And oh, no, 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 no. But anyway, huh? Yeah. Anyway, I appreciate our young people. They represented, number one, themselves well. They represented our church well. And they represented the Lord well. And I'm very proud of them. So we'll look forward to going back next year. All right? Anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? And I want you to notice your Bible. It's four things here. To fear the Lord thy God. When you fear God, that's one of the seven spirits of God. That's how you know that you're saved and you're right with God, is that you have a fear of God. Number two, to walk in all His ways. That means if God says do this, you do this. If God says do that, you do that. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Number three, and to love Him. If you love Him, you'll do these things. And number four, to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. All four of these things put together. Now, Deuteronomy 11, turn there. I know this don't have a lot of fire to it, but it's the Word of God. Deuteronomy 11, verse 1. Notice this also, therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. If you go back to Deuteronomy 6, actually let's see here, yeah Deuteronomy 10, notice that he says the fear of the Lord, to walk in all of his ways, to love him and to serve the Lord thy God. Four things here which correspond to the cross, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then in Deuteronomy 11, same thing, to keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. Again, four things. Remember what we learned, what, a couple Sundays ago, that all ten of the commandments that God gave us back in Exodus chapter 20, those are only made possible... Because Christ died, rose again in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How is it that we can keep His charge and His statutes and His judgments and His commandments always? It's only because of what Christ did on the cross. Loving God always starts at Calvary. God sent, God loved us first. Amen? Then we love God. Now look at verse 13. It shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, and to serve Him with all your heart, and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in His due season. First rain, and the latter rain. Think of Old and New Testament. Both of those. Those are the rain that God said His doctrine comes down as the showers. First and latter rain. Think of the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ. You pray for me. I'm about to get sick right now. That thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle. That thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived. Listen to this church. Listen to me. Or listen to the word of God. I know some people. Who did not give heed to themselves, they did not give heed to the Word of God. Their heart has been deceived, and they've turned aside. Whether people admit it or not, people acknowledge it or not, I've seen this, I've seen it all my life, I've been in church all my life. I've seen people come in the house of God, I've seen people leave the house of God. When you walk away from God, you don't just walk away from religion. You don't just walk away from serving something. You're always going to serve something the rest of your life. When you're not serving God, 
You're serving his enemies. That's what he said. Take heed to yourselves and that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. In Bible Christianity, we serve God and worship Him by number one, we come to church. We call this church service. Paul said that it's our reasonable service. We come into God's house, we pray, we love one another, we fellowship, we sing the old songs, and we hear and acknowledge the preaching of God's Word. That is us serving God. When you go out from this place, you live your life throughout the week, you serve God by the same thing. Pray, read your Bible, believing what God said, witnessing to others, that's serving God. When you turn your heart away from God, you are serving other gods. How do you do that? Live for yourself. Love yourself. Love your sins. Commit those sins. Give your life and your heart over to those sins that you said you wanted God to save you from. And yet you turn back to those same sins. See, these gods, these devils don't require that you believe that you're serving them to actually serve them. In fact, they don't require that you even believe that they exist. The devil doesn't require faith in him for you to be serving the devil. All you have to do is go out and fulfill the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Can I hear God's people say amen? So take heed that you not turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. The Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, and that there be no rain. You know what? Now, God meant exactly what he said by that. When he said he would shut up heaven and not send rain. All throughout the Old Testament, you see Israel stricken with, with drought. In fact, there were times when the drought would be so severe and the lack of food be so strong that mothers would actually resort to eating their own children. And yet there's a worse kind of famine that can happen. The book of Amos says that God said he'd send a famine in the land. But not a famine of food or drink. But a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. You see the rain that he sends down from heaven. This very rain that he sends down from here. Now maybe we've had a little bit too much of it. But at least the wells are full. Amen. Because when the wells get full. Who knows. You might need that next year. And it'll be there. You see, I've had times in my life where I've had plenty of the Word of God. In fact, I've, sometimes I think I read too much of the Word of God. But then lo and behold, I'll have droughts. I'll have times when I'm not reading the Word of God. What was it that sustains me? It was the times of plenty when God provided the rain. You never know when you're going to need it. Amen. And he shut up the heaven and there be no rain that the land yield not her fruit unless ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord your God, your God giveth you. Take heed to yourself that you read the word of God. That you spend time in prayer. That's your service to the God that you say you love. And if you will love and if you will love God the way you say you love God, you will have the word of God present in your life. God will will bend your knee and you will pray. Turn to Deuteronomy 13. And I'm going to end with this and I'm going to go lay down. Deuteronomy 13. If I were to ask this morning, who in here loves God? There would be hands all over the building. If I were to ask those of you online, do you love God? I'm sure you would respond yes. I've asked this question many times before and seen hands raised to heaven. Heaven. 
But God has a way of proving who loves him and who doesn't. Does he not? See, men can be fooled. I can be fooled. I've been fooled many times. God is never fooled. And if we say that we love God, and God knows we don't, He has a way of proving whether or not we do. And who does He prove it to? Well, I've said this before, God already knows, so He's not really proving it to Himself, is He? He's proving it, number one, to you. And then He's proving it to the people around you. If you say you love God, and you really love God, then when God makes proof of it, then you know it, and everybody knows it. But if you say you love God, and you don't love God, and God makes proof of it, then you'll know it, but it'll be too late. But then the people around you, they'll know that you were just lying. So Deuteronomy 13, here's the proof. Verse 1, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. Peter wrote in 2 Peter that many false prophets and false teachers have come and they will come. Paul said that in the last days, perilous times will come. People will heap up to themselves teachers having itching ears. Jude spoke of the false teachers and the false prophets of the last days. Ezekiel wrote about them in Ezekiel chapter 13, the prophets and the dreamer of dreams. Those men who said God said and yet God never said it. Where do these people come from? Does God allow false... Why does God allow false prophets? Why does God allow false teachers? Why does God allow false Bibles? One of my pastor friends sent a text message, a group text, to several ministers that he knows this morning. I was on that list. And he just said a word of encouragement to all of us men who were about to preach the Word of God this morning. If I would have said the man's name, you might know him. And to the preachers that he sent it to, various of them responded. One of them responded by quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Where in the King James it says, To them that love the Lord and are saved. But the verse that he sent didn't say those who are saved. It said those who are being saved. There's a big difference. Either you're saved or salvation is a process and who knows whether or not it'll actually succeed or not. So when I asked, I don't know whoever it was that some of the names didn't come up, just numbers. So I don't know the particular preacher who said that. When I asked the question back, are we saved or just being saved? I got a little notification that said so-and-so left the conversation. He didn't want to answer that. Why are there false Bibles? Why are there false Gospels? Why are there false teachers? Why are there false prophets? They're there to prove us whether or not we love God or not. Look at your Bible. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. And the sign of the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Remember, all you have to do to serve other gods is obey the lust of the flesh. That's all you have to do. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul. That's the proof. If you say you love God. And you really do love God. Then when the false prophets. The dreamer of dreams. Who want you to go out. Live like the devil. And thus serve the devil. 
When they come your way, you say, no, thank you. I don't believe that, and I'm not listening to it. There's a couple back here on the back row. I remember when you came visited here. Well, you're from Bloomsdale, aren't you? Right? I remember it. I just don't remember your name, but I remember who you are. You make them welcome. She said they were coming to look for a Bible or a church that just preached the King James Bible. I said, well, that would be us. So you pray for them as they look for a church home. Maybe God will send them here. Maybe God will send them someplace else. But at least here we believe what God said in his word. And that's the proof, isn't it? If you really love God, you'll believe what he said. And you won't listen to anybody else when they lie about it. So the Lord your God proves you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. Let's see. One, you shall walk after the Lord your God. Two, fear him. Three, keep his commandments, obey his voice, and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. You know what that means, cleave unto him? John DeMano is here this morning from Georgia. His wife, Bunny, is she watching? Hi, Bunny. Don't ask me what her real name is. It's Bunny. I guess it's Bunny. But he said, you know, when I'm out flying around, he's a commercial pilot, and he says, when I'm out flying around, I always keep in touch with my wife. Send her a text message. Honey, I love you. I'm thinking of you. I'm out on the road. He'll give her a call. Honey, bunny. Honey, bunny. Just want you to know I love you. Thinking about you. That is John cleaving to his wife. Adam said this in Genesis chapter 2. He said, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. You get around John and Bunny and you hear them talk. John will start talking and Bunny will finish the sentences. Amen? It's because she thinks she's smarter than he is and has to finish. No. They think alike. They cleave one to another. Like a husband does with his wife. Can I hear you say amen? That's what he means by that. If you love God, you'll cleave to him. And you just know what God's thinking. And God knows what you're thinking. Amen? And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage. To thrust, here's what that, that dreamer of dreams wanted to do. To thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. The way. Underline those two words. The way. Jesus said, I am the way. The truth. And the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And the prophet or the false prophet or the dreamer of dreams seeks to thrust you out of the way. That's somebody that's trying to sever the relationship that you have with your God and your Father. Anybody who tries to do that should be brought to death at least. Now, I'm not saying go out and shoot everybody you think is wrong about the Bible. Cubby, that's illegal, is it not? Okay, all right. But at least in your mind, these people are death to you. And you say, I'm not going to listen to that. That's a lie. They're trying to lie about God. They're trying to lie about the Bible. They're trying to lie about God's people. And I won't listen to it. Amen. Because God redeems you out of the house of bondage. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Well, that's my message. Let's bow our heads. 
I apologize for feeling the way I do today. But I want you to ask the question, do I really love God? If you do, it'll be known. God will find a way to prove it. I've been in this church a long time. I've been pastor of this church a long time. I've seen people come in that said, boy, I love God. And it doesn't matter how long it takes. Whenever lying words come their way, one day or another day, they're going to turn to that. And their heart's going to be turned against God. Their heart is going to be turned against God's Word. And God said, I sent that false prophet, that dreamer of dreams. I sent him to prove you whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart or not. You see, when false prophets and false teachers come, almost without fail, embedded in their words, is a love for self. Almost without fail. In fact, I would say without fail. Every false gospel, every false doctrine, at its core, is built in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And when you don't really love God, it will be manifested that you love yourself and that you love your sin more than you do anything. 2 Timothy chapter 3, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. This morning, if you love God, then you won't mind asking God to put that love on trial. If you love God more than you love yourself, and you love others more than you love yourself, you won't mind it. If God puts that on trial. Now, if there's a doubt in your mind, in your heart, I understand doubt. I do. Because sometimes I ask the question, God, do I love you enough? Do I love others enough? If that's the case, ask God to put it on trial. Then ask Him to give you grace while He does it. That way, if you find out you're not loving God enough, loving others enough, God can change you. God can help you with that before it's too late.